So the Michelin star chef decides he's going to fix this. He's had enough. And he goes into the kitchen. He pulls out the most expensive ingredients, ingredients in the world. And he sweats for 10 hours to make this dish. It's beyond three Michelin stars. And he takes it out to the head waiter. And he sits it down and he says, right, this is as good as it gets on planet Earth. Tell me what you think. And the waiter tries some and he goes, yeah, tastes like chicken. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. Oh, the gift that keeps on giving. The gift that keeps on giving. The gift of comedy. Indeed. <laughs> so, uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's digital download. Um I'm I'm the editor this week, which is uh, is very nice. Well, nice for me, and not necessarily nice for everyone else. Uh, anyway, as you know, uh, today uh, we are talking about entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship, and uh, it's interesting, isn't it? Because this this big sort of anomaly that goes on in in the modern world, uh, where it seems that the word entrepreneur is bandied around so much. Anyone who works for themselves is an entrepreneur. Anyone who runs a business is an entrepreneur. Anybody that gets made redundant from corporate life and then has to go out on their own is an entrepreneur. Uh, so, first of all, what is what is an entrepreneur? Uh, how does a, an entrepreneur uh, differ from normal people, people like you and me? So, go on, Tim, what, what do you think? Um, well, I, I've always thought an entrepreneur was that. I mean, we, we debated it here internally. We, I think, you know, there was six of us and we came up with seven definitions. For me, an entrepreneur is someone that it starts a business and, and starts something from scratch. That's what I've always thought. And any more? Anyone else got a thought on what an entrepreneur is? Yeah, I don't, I, think, I, don't, I don't think it's about, I don't think it's necessarily, clearly the output is a, 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 a commercial machine. You know, that could be, commercial however you define it there are entrepreneurs that have started charities that are entrepreneurs that have started impact businesses and all of that for me entrepreneurship and an entrepreneur is someone who's a certain spirit a drive and is able to connect dots in a way that maybe you know there are many brilliant managers out there who've had a 40-year career in management they come into work they do the thing they're fantastic we need them they're great at what they do uh, and we need millions and millions and billions of brilliant managers there are other managers who do that for a few years and say do you know what i think if i think if we connected that and that and that i think we could actually create something create something um and that i've worked some of the best entrepreneurial minds i've ever worked with aren't entrepreneurs by definition of have started their own businesses i've worked with brilliant entrepreneurial thinking people who work in big corporates and have done their whole life but they're fantastically they've got a fantastic entrepreneurial spirit they can join up dots they can see through sectors and industries and see things that don't exist create them and actually make them a commercial thing so i think the 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 uh <laughs> yeah you have to be able to spell on <laughs> yeah. i'm out so I, yeah, okay. Simply the act of, as you said, you know, you fall in hard times, you get made redundant, you start your own company. Does it make you an entrepreneur? I don't know. I think there's a sense and a spirit and a drive, a drive and a bit of a bit of connectivity and being able to see things differently in the world to be able to to be able to take that step forward and 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 move into that. You you were going to say something, I think, as well, Tracy, weren't you? Yeah, and it's 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 in line with what Eric was sharing because to me, entrepreneurship has this feeling of creation, right? Like I'm creating something. And so like when I was in university, I had a friend who bought a Subway franchise, right? And so technically he's a business owner, but he's not really creating anything. He's just like propagating the brand. Now, I love me a good Subway sub. So that was awesome, <laughs> especially in university. But to me, that doesn't really fall along the lines of entrepreneurship. Um, even like I had a conversation early on in my business with a gentleman who just wanted to start a business online. Right? And he had an online store and he mined Bitcoin and he just was like trying to be in business online. But he wasn't trying to create something new. He was trying to just do something to make money online. So I, in my opinion, I think we're all talking opinions <laughs> this morning. Uh, there's the, that like creating something from scratch mentality. Yeah, I, I, I think that's that's uh, that's reasonable. I, I love the fact. Uh, so our chairman, who's also our company accountant, he said about um, 
he said about an entrepreneur is somebody that needs an accountant to run along behind them, sweeping up to keep them out of prison. <laughs> not, not, not that he was think, suggesting for a moment that these people were crooks, but, but the fact that they, they took that leap of faith, they did something which was kind of out there. They, they, they run with their instinct. So, um, uh, we have a guest who's coming on. Now, there's little doubt that this man is an entrepreneur. Uh, he started in the telecoms industry and he founded a plumbing call center, which he sold to GE Capital. He then founded a company called Table, Cable Telecom, uh, which he sold to Telstra, the uh, Australian telco. Uh, he then founded Network Europe, which he sold to the Daisy Group, which is a large telecoms company. And then, uh, still on the telecoms theme, he founded uh, a company called Paddy and Scott's, which is a coffee company. So <laughs> enti entirely different. Uh, and he, he founded that with uh, a, a friend that he'd met, uh, a small startup coffee company, which uh, fairly quickly became the biggest supplier, independent supplier of coffee uh, in the UK. Uh, won multiple awards uh, and... Uh, is doing some really great philanthropic stuff uh, with with the profits and fair trade and all of that. Anyway, I think one thing that we can certainly agree on is that this man is an entrepreneur in the truest sense of the world. So, uh, welcome to Scott Russell. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Scott. Scott. Yeah, welcome. I love that intro. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> uh, some great some great comments on the side here. Does entrepreneurism uh, taught at school? I don't, I don't know, guys. I think, you know, I, I believe in intrapreneurs as well. I think that's really important. Um, yeah. But, and I also, if you break the word down, entree to follow on. So is an entrepreneur someone that can fail and then get up and do it again? Is an entrepreneur somebody that can build a business, learn from that and build another one? And I think that uh, I'm on my fifth company. I've wow. never, ever worked for anybody else. So from the age of 16, when I left school, I've only ever worked for myself. So I don't, I've never heard that term, my, can I ask my boss? You know, I wonder what, <laughs> that's beyond my pay grade. I've, I've never heard, I've never used that term. But, um, but yeah, I think entrepreneurialism is about doing, building, rebuilding. And if you fall over, don't care. Don't worry, you can get up and you can do it again. That's the true mark of an entrepreneur, in my humble opinion. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. And the thing that I love about your story, and, and we see it with with a number of famous entrepreneurs, you know, when when you watch a program like Dragon's Den, which is full of these mega successful entrepreneurial business people, and some of them seem like they are pretenders to the throne. You know, they've started a business, they've made a fortune, they've exited the business. That's it. That's not entrepreneurship. That's having run a successful business. The people that are, in my opinion, entrepreneurs are the ones that go and they do it again and again and again and again and again. And these businesses are not carbon copies of the same business. They're completely different things. And the thing sure, that, Surely if you do it once or you do it eight times, you're still an entrepreneur. Yeah, but, but you can be lucky. You can be in the right place at the right time. Lucky right? entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, you, you do see it, don't you? When somebody has something which is absolutely what's needed at the right time, but happened to be, you know, as Steve Ballmer, we great example of that. You know, he's not an entrepreneur. He, he was, you know, the uh, chief exec of, of, uh, of, of Microsoft for a while, you know, one of the richest people in the world. He happened to be in the right place at the right time. Equally, you see people like Elon Musk, who is an entrepreneur, you know, because he, he does something and then he does something else and he does something else and he sees an opportunity in a marketplace, whether you love him or hate him, sees something which he thinks can be done differently, stroke better, stroke in a new way. And that's what he, he rolls up his sleeves and does it. That's a I have a, I have a question, entrepreneur question Scott. Um, uh, and this is, this, this is probably going to burst my theory, um, but was it, in the, was it in the Russell bloodline? Yeah, I think so. My mom and dad were pretty uh, entrepreneurial when I use that word there, uh, entrepreneurial. So um, they were they were market traders. Right. So uh, at a very young age, my, my brother and I learned to the, the value of money and working hard. But the challenge is, guys, what is success, though? Because I'm asked this question a lot and I have an honorary degree. I've never worked for it. I was given it because I was an entrepreneur. So I've got a little certificate that says I am a proper entrepreneur. And uh, people always ask me, 
how do you gauge success? And I've got to a stage in my life now where I think it's not just about money. It really isn't about money because if you can do some pretty cool stuff now and you can start to use your skills to help. And um, we, we all talk about corporate social responsibility, ESG, but really, guys, an entrepreneur, I think the modern day entrepreneur has a sense of purpose in their doing. I really believe that. And if you can measure success, not just on the size of your wallet, but maybe the amount of school meals you can fund, mm -hmm. the amount of people that you can inspire on your... Imagine if success was measured on stamps in your passport. You know, now we're getting in some really cool stuff now. T so tell us that story, Scott. Tell us tell us that story, because we chatted the other day and uh, and you you hinted at some of these things that you're doing outside of running a successful uh business and it was it was really inspiring so so tell everybody so what do you do <laughs> I, i've got the best job in the world i create little cups of ambition li little cups of happiness and and this coffee that i produce uh does some pretty cool stuff around the world so um we uh decided to to break down the supply chain coffee is the second most commonly traded commodity in the world. Number one is oil, number two is coffee. And it's a really elongated supply chain. And I wanted to break it down and I challenged the chief exec of Fair Trade. I've challenged the chief exec of, um, of, of the Rainforest Alliance. And I just want to know, what are you doing with the tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars I have to pay you to put that little stamp on my back? And I thought I could do it better. So um, that's exactly what we did. We, we, we created our own projects. We've worked with the International Trade Center, which is part of the United Nations. And we're just trying to work out a better supply chain. And guys, you can go to New York and buy a cup of my coffee for $8. And yet less than one cent of that goes back to the farmer. There's something not right. There's something yeah. not right there. And we challenged that 10 years ago. And I'm on that journey. So don't gauge my cup. I thank you, Adam, for saying it's one of the best coffee companies in the UK. And we do produce over 80,000 cups of coffee per day. But the profit we're making, because we're a profitable company and we have to be. I'm a die in the wall capitalist. But just gauge me on what I do with that now. And I think true entrepreneurs will look at that profit and they'll say, how can I make the world a better place? And it sounds all wishy-washy and Iggy Guy and all that sort of rubbish. But guys... If you can do something that you love and you can do something that the world needs and you can do something that makes money, to me, that's utopia. Yeah. That's utopia. True entrepreneur. So, so explain what some of those projects are for everybody. So, so you've spoken about how you, you want to do some things around the world, but you told me some of these the other day when we spoke. And it's like, it, it's one thing to talk about it. And we hear this all the time from corporates. Well, of course, you know, we're putting money back into the environment and they're not, you know, or they, it, they, they are, they are dripping stuff there, but you actually, you, you are at the sharp end of making a difference for, and changing people's lives, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, we do. And, you know, doing good is good for business. I, I genuinely, genuinely believe that. And I think that if your company has a sense of purpose that you live and you die by, then your team believe in that. And I don't pay the best wages, but people work for my company because they want to work for my company. We win corporate accounts because people want to be part of that journey. So the whole idea, the concept of Paddy and Scott's is to share the retail margin with the growers. It's as simple as that. You know, if someone's spending three, four, five dollars on a cup of coffee, I think that we should we have a responsibility to share that with the people and the communities mm -hmm. and the supply chain and the children. Now, when I first turned up at our farm, there was kids running around and there was a little mud oh, hole. Hold on a second. And... Your farm. Your farm. Yeah, talk, I'll, I'll talk come about to that. It. First. I'll come to it. I'll come to it. I'll come to it. I'll come to it. Okay. I'm all excited. So, uh, party. <laughs> Too much so coffee. I, I didn't. <laughs> I, I didn't like I didn't like what I saw. So I, 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 I went to Africa, East Africa, I actually went around the world, ended up in some really cool places, but finally ended up in East Africa. And I met a brilliant family called the Machomba family, and they just needed some guidance some investments. And we looked at their farm project and I could have bought the farm. But I didn't want to do that. So basically, I'm, I've taken on a 10 year lease on this project. And at the end of it, I will hand the project back to the family for one dollar. 
And that's my commitment. And during that time, I will spend hundreds of thousands of dollars making this the best farming project the world has ever seen. Don't take my word for that. Take the United Nations report on our project. The white paper's there. You can Google it. You can read it there. I won't go into that. So the whole idea is then let's, what do people need? Not only do they need, they need, they need homes, they need food. They need, uh, the children need a school. So let's run this. Let's run the water in. Let's do it ourselves. But don't get a contractor in. I've still got the scar on my hand where I was digging the channel for the water. Let's build a school, not for 60 kids, but for 500 kids. Let's do it. Let's let's get corporates behind this business and let's do it. Let's get it done. Then we said, well, how can we make it even better than that? So we got our corporate customers to be involved in the project. We got those guys to big corporates that you'll know about, Marriott, Green King. These are companies now that are supporting and helping grow this project. And I think if we can do it in East Africa, we can do this around the world. And I think we can make coffee a much more sustainable, profitable business for the people actually growing it. Because if we don't do it, guys, and here's a warning now, people will stop. They will stop growing coffee. So we will lose that. And that will just push commodity prices up. The big agri Do you know what, guys? I think um, just doing good stuff is good for business. Scott, the 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 one penny from eight dollar cup going back to the the farmer, the the one penny. What's the ambition? From one uh, penny well, I, I, I'd like to I'd like to make you know most of the profit go back, and then that's what I would like to do. But I can't. There is this white savior syndrome. It's very complex. There are tribes. There are cultures. You can't just come in. You build a school, then the the the, the, the neighbouring schools they want to move in. You know, it's it's really hard. It sounds great, and I'm running around, and I'm ambitious, and I. But you have to learn the culture as well. So um, eventually, I'd like to take the lead of Patagonia. I'd like to take my company and hand it over and say, "There you go, guys. That's the world's best coffee company. That's what we're going to do." At the moment, we are a for-profit business, and I say that with pride. And then just, but then challenge me on stage. Don't mind. Challenge me on what we do with that profit. And I think that's something that's not for this conversation, but perhaps for another conversation. Cool. Brilliant. So we, we've, Scott, we've had a question. Um, for some reason or other, um, Shelley Jeffcoat's name isn't displaying. Um, when did you shift your strategy from profit to supporting more ESG efforts? Was that a decision when you were establishing the business or something you shifted to um, after some time? No, it's just it's it's an entrepreneurial trait. Let's go back to the core reason why we're here today. As an entrepreneur, you'll have gut feelings. As an entrepreneur, I won't look at a balance sheet. As an entrepreneur, I'll think, Christ, how do I promote my product? And it just makes sense. If you see a child fall over in the street, you will pick that child up. You will make sure they're OK. And it's that mindset that you apply to your business. So I realize now if everybody enjoys what they're doing who works at Paddy and Scott's and we're a, a reasonable sized business, then it will create a successful business. It will create a successful proposition. So um, no, it's always been embedded because it's the right thing to do. I'm not gonna put it into a spreadsheet. I'm not gonna try and justify that. And, and I'll challenge you, it's just the right thing to do. I trade in people's lives and I do. In tech, I'm distracted from it. In tech, it either works or it doesn't. If it works, people buy it. If it doesn't work, they drop you. You don't need to build up a, a reputation. Food is really, really difficult to do that. And it's a lot quicker. I've had Paddy and Scott's 15 years. I've never had a business that long. Normally I've exited <laughs> with him. With him. This is a new place for me to, I'll tell you what guys, I love it. I really do, I really love it. So, so, so what, why don't we go back to the beginning then? So uh, your parents were market traders, you started uh, your first business because you couldn't bear the thought of being responsible to somebody else or answerable to somebody else. So, so take us quickly on your journey of how you got to a guy that had just exited his business sitting in his local cafe and someone comes up and says, coffee. And you go, yeah, why not? Because that's a big change for him. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, if there's any lawyers listening, it was a restricted covenant. I couldn't go back into tech. So I had to do something that wasn't connected to my company that I just sold. So um, there was a big there was a big check and uh, money wasn't an issue. Um, it was a great one. It's one of your questions here. How long did it take you to come up with that business? I'll come back to that, Adam. I'll come back to it. But when I invested in the business, I put five grand in, you know, chicken feed, really, for a foundation of a business, but 5,000 quid. And I did, the, 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 we didn't have a name for this investment, so I just called it Paddy and Scott. So that's why we called, there's a name, how long did you come up with the business name? And we were going to use that business name until such time as we created a brand. But the brand become the people. The people become the brand. And everywhere we peddled our coffee to, they kept saying, is this the Paddy and Scott's coffee? Is this the Paddy and Scott? So it stayed there. So what I wanted to do, Adam, is I, I, I was... I'd sold my company to Telstra, um, at one of the biggest companies in the world, and I had 18 million customers when I sold my business. So it was a reasonable sized business. And I was fired within a week of working in Telstra. And uh, the reason why I said um, I've never had a boss, and I hope they're on the line or one of this call, is that no one would take on the mantle of managing me. So no one would take it on. So they couldn't find a manager to manage me, so they fired me. And they said to me, um, just go and play golf. Spend your money, Scott. Enjoy it. You're a young guy. Go and enjoy it. Um, and I, I got into coffee because it's something that I love. It's something I like doing. And it's something I'm really proud of. And I was proud of the money that I earned before, but I probably wasn't proud of what I was doing. It's like a therapy session, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but I, I, think, I, I think that the the fact that you you have been hugely successful uh you know explaining the journey to people and what your learnings have been because uh you know when, when you look at the ted talks of people like ken robinson and you know you, you realize that people are not getting education in the things that they need in order to be successful in the world that is forming around us. Because all of the, the kind of formal education comes from old people like us uh, saying this is what it used to be like in my day. And actually, you've, you've had a much more seat of the pants story of success, but actually encouraging people to, to behave that way is what's going to make more entrepreneurs and more successful people, not studying how IBM built a business 75 years ago, because that's irrelevant in the modern world. So so what have you learned along the way to get to where you are? Uh, well, I, I, I'm fortunate I get to give quite a few talks to uh, young, budding business people. I'm not going to call them entrepreneurs. And these range from the age of 12 all the way up to you know, 2022. And, uh, and I do that in schools and I, 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 I get to, to, to listen to unfiltered comments, comments that you wouldn't put your hand up because you're too embarrassed to ask a question. But these guys won't. So are there on? I tell you what, guys, some of the business ideas they've come up with are, are brilliant. And I think that perhaps we do try to pigeonhole business now into spreadsheets, into lawyers, into, you know, and I, I get really frustrated with this. You've got to raise two million quid now, bootstrap money before you can do it. And I get, you know, these, entre on, these business people um, cracking open champagne because they've raised a hundred grand's worth of debt. You know, they've sold half their business for a hundred grand. Now they can go out and make money. Don't, I, you know, I, I, I mentored a beach cleaning team that was turning over 11 grand a month, 11,000 pounds a month. These guys were 14 years old. Can you imagine how you can scale that business? And there are 257 beaches around the UK. So I tell you what, if you want to back young entrepreneurs, just talk to them. Mm. Go, you know, give a talk in a classroom. Go out and listen to what they're saying and tell the teachers to shut up. D -d Don't interact. Just get the children to talk. Get the young adults to talk. And I tell you what, there are some gems out there. I'm really proud. If I was a young entrepreneur now setting up in business, even with the, the turbulence that's ahead of us, I think there's never a... really do. And I genuinely believe that. And my son runs a brilliant marketing agency. He's 23 years old and he's winning business. A 23-year-old kid should not be winning. But he is because there is no barriers now. There isn't. You know, you can get TikTok superstars that are 10 years old. What would I pay to reach 10 million people 20 years ago? I'll tell you what, there's never a more exciting time to be in business. It really is.
There is a bit of a shift, though, in, in, in the scholastic um, regime. I was, before my son went off to university, um, just when he was in fifth year, I was quite uh, inspired when he came home and I said, what, what were you doing today? And he said, well, we're finding out how to start a business. And I said, how do you mean? He said, well, it was all about getting investment and taking ideas through to fruition and hiring staff and setting up and and product development and all of that. So it is creeping. I know Noel asked the question, should it be on school? I don't know if that was just a, a one-off example, but I think it is It is creeping into schools in some respect now. The fact that, I mean, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, I, I left school in the 80s and in the area that I lived in, the geography that I lived in and my uh, sort of like social circumstances, every single person at my school was programmed to go and get a job with a company, either in a factory or in a company, uh, or or go to college or go to university. That's what you do. You get married, you have a kid, and you just repeat the cycle. And they'll they'll get a job when they leave school and all of that. The reason I asked the question, Scott, about whether it was in the DNA is because it wasn't in my DNA. I had to learn it from mm. other people and get and get confidence and and the the ability and to learn that that actually I was I was pushed down a certain route where like in your in your in your house I imagine when you were a kid growing up the idea of running your own business was normal yeah and um, the idea of running your own business was hilarious in my house that's ridiculous because you join a company <laughs> and you get a pension and you get benefits and that's it for the rest yeah. of your life you die um and I, and I wish I wish to some to, to some respect that I'd that I'd had that confidence and at least been open and saw, saw the light like Maybe some of these young kids are actually sitting in that fifth year class going, all oh, right, so you can do this yourself. That's cool. I, Eric, if I could, I want to try to reframe that. So um, to, to, to talk about how maybe some of that entrepreneurship actually is in your blood. Okay, Ooh. so I'll share a story about myself mm. and then I'll bring it back to you. When I went to college, um, in my last year of college, I realized, oops, I do not have all the credits that I need in order to graduate. And we had something called a blue book. And I went through that blue book and I found a very, a prov just what, this provision in there where you could double up on your senior project and get twice the credit. <laughs> that's, a, that's a high risk proposition because it's one project, but I'm going to get twice the the credit. So I used that provision to get the credits that I needed and, and I did well on the project and it worked out very well. When I went to law school, I had a similar kind of situation which suggests something about my math, but I found another provision where I could double up on my third year project, high risk proposition, but I'll get twice the credit. Okay? So I'll suggest to you that there is something in my DNA that has a higher risk tolerance mm. than the regular yep. person or the regular, in that case, student, okay? And I kind of noticed that over the years. And there are things that I think are in your DNA that are really uh, relevant for entrepreneurship. Uh, the number one thing is resilience, okay? That that the stuff you did with that thing where you're running through the desert that is the that is the that is the most um that requires a tremendous amount of mental toughness and resilience and you need that for entrepreneurship um scott talked about that it's something i say all the time which is that you're not an entrepreneur until you become an entrepreneur which means there's a process of getting knocked down of actually failing and being able to get back up from that and keep going, which is, you know, critical in entrepreneurship. And I think, you know, that resilience that you have, which is shown in that competition that you did, is is actually entrepreneurship in your DNA. Oh, thank you, thank you. I think I think you're I think you're probably right. But but my my social circumstances growing up. And this general way that I grew up compressed that a little bit. So I was probably I remember when I was a when I was a young milk milk boy when I was at when I was at school. I used to go up at four thirty in the morning and deliver milk. Um, the farmer told me that he was he was frustrated because he couldn't find people to come and work for him. Nobody wanted to get up at four thirty before they went to high school. And I said, well, well, why don't we try something different? I'll hire them. I'll bring them to you. 
<laughs> and, I, and I'll 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 tell them it's a you know a great life. You get great tips and all that. And I'll take a pound a week mm. off of each of them. Deal. You get them, and I'll give you a pound a week for everyone that you bring in. So I thought I was a little a little entrepreneur. But then, of course, when it came time to leave school, my dad said, "You're going to be an electrician. You're going to get a job, and you're just going to be." And I, and I got sucked into a little a little sort of like sausage machine of just like doing the same thing. And before I knew it, ten years had passed, fifteen years had passed. Um. Anyway. So so how so how did you cope, Scott, with the fact that so so if although Eric didn't fit into the box that his upbringing had put him in, uh, lots of people are in that situation. You know, they go to school, they have careers that are laid out before them. They go to university, they study, they enter that career or apprenticeship or B tech or whatever it may be. And they go into that career and their future is mapped out. Like Eric said about, you know, you get a job, you get married, you have children, they get a job, they get married, they have children. And, you know, it's this end. So so your future is is uh, laid out for you. How did you cope with not being scared about the fact that your future wasn't laid out for you? So you left school and it's like, OK, so what, what do I do? H- how did you get direction because i think there'll be lots of people out there that have a desire to be like you but wouldn't know where to begin how do i find something i can do how can i find something i can throw myself into it's easy to look back and go well of course you start a social network like twitter and you become inf- you know infinitely fun and the next minute you sell it to telstra yeah yeah <laughs> so, so so how did you how did you stay focused how did you think yeah this is worth a try in the early days. Yeah, like, I mean, guys, uh, you know, I, I left school at 16 and I did an apprenticeship. Uh, I, I studied geomology and jewellery design. So I went to, I got an internship to Sir John Cass College. And um, so, uh, you know, although I, I talk about this sort of market trader up, upbringing, it's, you know, I did have a good couple of years where I had to study and had to learn. Um, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I'm building a house at the moment and my electricians, carpenters, the tilers, the money these boys are earning now is unbelievable. And I've got four sons. And do you know what? My The guy that's putting the tech into my house and building the electric and the data roof and the solar panels and so forth, they're charging more money per hour than my lawyers. So I tell you what, guys, there is something about a trade. There is something about a backup plan. And then once you've learned that plan, apply what you've learned into uh, what you want to do. But... I think we're so hung up and I keep on saying this. It's not just about making money. It is about having that, 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 that tertiary, you know, does the world want it? Do you enjoy doing it? Can you make money from it? And if you apply to that and I think you can do it, don't worry about failing. Everybody says that to you. How many times you hear it so many times. Don't worry about failing. Yeah. But let me tell you now, you do absolutely learn more when you fail than you do succeed. Absolutely, and I will have. I'll debate that until the cows come home. The I, I, you learn more money on your failures. And then I remember someone saying to me, "You're not an entrepreneur unless you've had two foul businesses." I think very much a, a U.S. sort of mentality. I don't buy into that, but I, I, I do believe that you shouldn't be scared. And if you are scared at the top, you hear this again, then you shouldn't be at the top. Take two two ruts down. It's lonely at the top. It's lonely at the top, isn't it? No, it's not lonely at the top. You know, you meet so many people to support you on the way there that they are there to support you with you at the top. You don't sit at the top. You don't sit at the top of pyramids. A business by its definition is plural. So, yeah, I, I, I you know, I, I think we should teach it in schools. I'm going off a tangent, sorry. And I think that we should teach entrepreneurism. And I think that no, no route is a bad route. Absolutely not. Scott, you mentioned... Uh, speaking to students and there were some great ideas that they had, it it seems to me the gap between a great idea and a successful venture comes down to execution. So I'm curious about your, your willingness to be wrong because in our society, it seems that the only thing worse than doing nothing is being wrong. What are your thoughts around that? Yeah, you know, I, 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 we all talk about our successes. You know, I, 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 I thought I could walk on water, um, Rob, and I, I bought an engineering company called Ensian Technologies. They were a data engineering business, and I just had no idea how to run an engineering company. I didn't understand how the engineers weren't 
um, you know, motivated by some, with those guys. It's about doing a good job. It's about creating infrastructure that works and their KPIs are based on if you flick a switch, does it work? Well, I just assumed it would work. So I had a failed business and it nearly bankrupted me. Um, but was I scarred? Absolutely not. And when I say bankrupt, I mean, literally no money left in the bank. You know, I've got a wage bill. I had a £90,000 wage bill to pay at the end of the week. And I'm thinking, Christ, you know, do I speak to my mum? Do I, do I, do I you know, go around and, you know, and do I put it on my credit card? Well, you do. But no, the resilience is that didn't put me off because I'm not going to go into manufacturing again. I can tell you that now. And that's something I've learned along the way. Mm. So is it fair to say that if you are a person that's looking for uh, that avenue into entrepreneurship, it is a good idea to start looking at area, your areas of expertise, uh, things that you know very well, and opportunities that might come from that space? Yeah, I think so. I think so. There's no point. You, you've got to have a passion for something. I really believe that. I think you do need a passion. If you haven't got a passion, you can't fake it. You know, that, that comes over quite sinister. Um, you know, so you, you do you do need to have a passion. Uh, and there's loads of things you can be passionate about. So, yeah, I didn't have a passion for engineering, for uh, manufacturing. I thought I did. I thought that was the missing piece of my jigsaw. But it was the wrong piece. Mm, great, great point. Mm. So, Scott, good question for you. Um, have you ever owned a personalised number plate, registration plate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, T-W-A-T, I think it says on my number plate. Uh, no, I do. I do. I do have one, absolutely. I have, uh, I have three. I have three. Three number plates. Go on, tell, 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 tell the story about closed, closer. <laughs> That's a great story. I can't believe you raised this. I can't <laughs> believe. Okay, it's very, 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 very quickly, guys. In the, I assume this audience goes around the world, but number plates are quite expensive. And um, I saw this number plate once when I was a young sales guy called Closer. C-1-0-S-E-R. Closer. And I wanted that. I wanted that on my car. And I saw it as an auction in Birmingham. And I went there with my, I thought I'd pay £5,000 for this. And, and the bidding started and it went 5, 7, 12, 21, 30. And it just carried on going. And I just walked down of the, the auction despondent and I couldn't believe how much somebody played for closer. So uh, I went on to the DVLA and I said, look, uh, is it possible to buy it? This is an entrepreneur. Is it possible to buy it now before the auction had finished? And they've said, no, this is up for auction today. You can't buy it. But what I do have is C10SED, closed. And I went, wow, is that for sale? And they went, yes, it is. And I said, I said, and I was, I was driving my car hands free. I pulled over. And I went, right, how much can I buy it for? And I had £195, so 600 quid. And uh, I was at a sales conference at the Celtic Manor, and I turned down an offer for £50,000 for that number plate. So I still have it. I don't have it on my car anymore. It's on a retention certificate. I think even me, with my ego the size of a house, couldn't drive around with closed on my, on my number plate. But yes, Adam, I do have a... Uh, and it's not on my personalised space at work uh, Mark, uh, as one of the questions come through, absolutely not. I, uh, my CEO wouldn't allow it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Love that story. Brilliant. He's got C zero F F E E three three. Coffee. <laughs> yeah, not quite. Yeah. Not quite. He, but, um, he'll yeah. be straight we'll... to the DPLA when we're done today. <laughs> yeah. Have you got coffee? Trying to buy it, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, has anyone else got any more questions for, for Scott? What's next? Um, I've got some lovely, some great ideas, actually. Um, I, I think the wine industry has got some legs. I think British wine is, uh, is, uh, has got a, a, a fantastic opportunity. I think that um, with um, one of the, the issues of climate change is that we are growing some pretty good wines now in, in, um, in, in the UK. I think that's pretty exciting. I love digital media. I, 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 have, I play a very small part in my son's company, and I'm unbelievably impressed of how they put campaigns together, 
based on you know hotspots on screen, time of day, demographics, and these are unbelievably switched on kids that are just creating some amazing stuff. So I, I think the space that you guys are in is really really exciting. But at the end of the day, um, I, I don't really care about money. Uh, you know, I've, I've made enough money. I, I can. I, I don't need any more money. I, I'm, I'm I'm okay. I think I can survive the uh, the crisis. So anything I do will be based on what I want to do. And what I want to do for the world, and I, I say that honestly from the heart. So, um, you know, if I, if I can build another ten more schools, then I'll do that. If I can build uh, an infrastructure to give back, then I'll, I'll do that, and I'm doing that now. Cool, thank awesome. you, brilliant, lovely. Well, thank you so much for being our guest today, Scott. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> fantastic, and uh, I mean, judging by all the questions that we've got from from the audience, they they loved having you on as well. So. Uh, yeah. thank you and uh we'll, it's we'll absolutely all... absolutely my pleasure guys yeah thank you and i did make the tech work as well actually i did you make didn't the tech. i was really Just... impressed with myself i did <laughs> even though i did need some condoling now there, there's okay. an idea you should, well, i'm gonna you love should... you and i'm gonna love you and leave you go on carry on sorry cool. i talked over you uh, no it, uh, uh, mark put wine flavored coffee in there so i was going to say mark don't don't offer it. Sell that idea to Scott. He's in <laughs> Woffy, Woffy, it's the next big thing. <laughs> Mark, I, I, I tell you what, though, guys, we've got we're, we're doing this 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 coffee that you uh, mature in uh, whiskey barrels, and it takes on the uh, the flavour of whiskey. So uh, you, you let it infuse for about three months, about twelve weeks, uh, and the coffee that we're producing is, is is quite unusual taste. It's it's proper. It's real. It's authentic. Uh, well, so we're having some fun with some whiskey flavoured coffee. But Mark, uh, no, 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 not wine flavoured. Don't ruin the wine. Don't ruin it. You know, coffee right. is a day Mark, wine. Mark Don't Harrison ruin it. A, Mark Harrison is a whiskey fanatic, so he'll be all over that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, brilliant. I want to thanks for all the, uh, the comments, guys, as well. It's lovely to see those coming through. Uh, I'm going to leave you with your hosts now. I've got to pick up uh, my, my kids from a sports fixture. So um, I'm going to skedaddle now. Thank you. Thanks, very Scott. Much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Take care. Bye -bye. I'll let you take turn so me off. <laughs> what a great wow. guest. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. Really, uh, I, I like, uh, who was it? Mark said, uh, infectious. You know, that Absolutely. is for what it is that he does. And and I think that certainly for, for me, you know, the fact that you were kind of, captain of your ship on the ocean and you can point it in any direction uh you know having some person to somebody that's done it and been really successful but not once through a bit of luck but successful again and again and again and again and again in what they've done and the learnings that we can get from that i think are, are really valuable oh big time and i think um you know i had my daughter i took my daughter's well, they're technically still in the public school system, but I, I took them out of our local town public school system and put them into a charter school. And in that, it's a sustainability focused charter school. And in that school, they work in teams, they work on projects, they uh, learn design thinking. So it just, I can't remember whose point it was. Um, I think maybe it was Eric. It is starting to creep in. I really think too slowly into the school systems that uh, we need to teach these kids how to um, work together, work on projects, to fail forward. Um, that was a conversation they had. Uh, my daughter actually had being new to this uh, as a sixth grader, being new to the school. She was very concerned about, you know, uh, failing and getting in trouble for different things. And they had to tell her, no, what if even when we fail, we're going to just get back up and we're going to see what we can do to make it better. But we're going to do that together. So um, I think those are great lessons for kids to learn that are very applicable to, you know, the world today. Rob's got the manual. Rob's got the, the hens manual. I taught, oh. I taught entrepreneurship at the high school level. It was an wow. elective oh. and uh, not many students took it and it was a half year elective, but there are opportunities. Unfortunately, they are few and far between because school was not set up to inspire entrepreneurship. School was set up to inspire people or to train people to be able to work in the factory and take orders yeah okay, and so how we execute on school these days is still all around uh, conforming 
and following uh, orders, not thinking for oneself. So even the, the entrepreneurship class and the things that I try and integrate into the college students I'm teaching now, it's more done through skunk works than it is through formal practice. Wait a minute. What? <laughs> what was what was that term you used? Skunk works or skunk? you've never heard of a skunk works project? No, no. It's, oh, it's a, elaborate on that. It's a ter it's a term used in uh, in search of excellence. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know it was that. from there. I just know that when you're trying to get something done in in your uh, in my experience, it was in in corporate America when you're trying to. Uh, advocate for a project that has no support and uh, you're just doing it on your own you, you're you're doing it under the radar it, it it's a skunk works project yeah uh, that's, that's, uh, it, it was the uh, uh, CIA skunk works that produced the uh, SR 71 blackbird wasn't it under the radar of everybody else and it got to, <laughs> to being produced indeed uh, without anyone knowing about it very interesting and um, just just on a just on a little admin point, in case I forget before we go, anyone who's appearing as LinkedIn user on this on this platform, if you want to drop me a little note, I can send you an easy link. It's just three steps to fix that. It's really easy, so that you'll appear with your picture and your name. Just drop me a little note, and I'll send you the link. It takes ten minutes to do it. So, and many so Jeff, Kelly Jeffcoat is, I think, is the person that's. <laughs> yep, and and it takes it takes. Five so she's coming on a paired link, so it's not. She's not looking at my profile. She's looking at and like she's someone else. Someone else. I think she's probably on mine. Right. There's something. There's something wonderful. I mean, entrepreneurs have changed the world, right? I just. I just think um, maybe maybe not in changing the world, but what he's going to do with the profits from this business. Um, ben Francis, fourteen years old, sitting in his room, started selling. What's your last name, Eric? Eric Doyle. Eric Doyle. D O Y L E. And it's got F I S P after it, so um, so you can find me there. And I and I look like this. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly what it looks like. Fun fact, and I'm not just reaching for profile views here, right? But my daughter's a fantastic graphic designer, and I said, "Can you, can you, um, give me a photograph for my profile?" And she said, "Yeah." And she said, "I found one that I really like, but unfortunately, you're wearing headphones, cans. So I've I've um, I've taken those cans off." And I've put someone else's ears on, so the ears on my profile picture are not. <laughs> are, are they are they better or worse than your ears? Whose ears? They're slightly lower than my own ears are, but I've grown to like them. So whoever, whoever donated those ears to my profile picture, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, so I had I I was That's told wonderful. by somebody that I had to have a my my profile. Is 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 to, is is here, and they said I can't use that. There's got to be a top of a head. So they actually basically took, they took a, a, a head of somebody else. A boiled egg. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Nice. Ben Francis, the, ben the Francis. magic that is happening. <laughs> ben Francis in from Birmingham, sitting in his room, um, buying in sports vests and putting on a little logo on them in his room and selling them at school and selling them at the local markets and at um, uh, car boot sales, right? His parents said, right, you need to stop all this malarkey now. And he's like, that's fine. I make a couple of hundred pounds a week. It's lovely. And I'm going to continue doing this. I'm going to make a global beating sportswear line. And they're like, there's quite enough of them in the world. Have you ever heard of Nike or Adidas or anyone like that? You know, it's, it's pretty big, son. So... How about university and a degree and, and all of that, or get a job? And he's like, I'm going to stick with this. Uh, in 2012, he registered Gymshark. They've just been valued at $1.3 billion. Wow. He's 28 years old. And what did his parents say to that? Well done, son. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're misremembering that. I never told you to stop. I never did. No, they said, Ben, Ben, I asked for the Bentley in blue, and it's turned up in black. Yeah, one point three billion dollars. Now you go to a gym in Scotland. I don't know if it's. I th they're definitely getting into America now. Gym Shark's becoming a thing. You go to a gym in the UK. Everyone's wearing Gym Shark. Everyone. I wouldn't know, Eric, having not been not? to a gym for twenty five years. There are places. There are places where people go and there's exercise machines and weights where you can go and do oh, classes and, and oh, things I can like. Imagine that. nothing worse. 
<laughs> Imagine nothing worse. Well, if you do decide you're going to go uh, one day, um, you'll probably buy yourself a Gymshark top to go because I'm nobody else fit in perfectly. Yeah, absolutely. One point three billion dollars from wow. from from ironing shirts in a little house in Birmingham with a logo on them and selling them. Now a major powerhouse in global sportswear. Incredible, and he's a lovely guy. But, but it, it's interesting, isn't it? That that uh, clearly an entrepreneur. You know, he had a vision, he saw an opportunity, he exploited the opportunity and developed something from scratch. Yeah. And maybe it's that fear of failure. Maybe that's the thing. Maybe that that's the thing that precludes people from becoming entrepreneurs. You know, I'm scared because society stigmatizes failures in whatever area. You know, you should have done that better. You did this wrong. You know, here's a mistake that you made. And and actually what what we need to do is recognize that it's all part of the learning. You know, there's that lovely story, isn't there, of the guy at, and I think it was at IBM, and he 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 made a mistake and it cost IBM like five million dollars. And he went to see his manager and his, he said to his manager, you know, I, I, I guess I'd better clear my desk. And the manager said, why? And he said, well, you know, we've just lost five million dollars because of this mistake I made. And the manager said to him, and I imagine this is quite rare within that conservative type of company. Manager said to him, why on earth would I sack you? You've just had five million dollars worth of training. <laughs> that idea of of embracing that learning as long as you do learn from it clearly if you keep losing five minutes tim, tim and i did a talk for a life sciences company on one occasion and uh one of the sponsors for the talk that we were giving said uh I, I want you all to embrace this and do this i sent a tweet and it wiped a billion euros off the market capitalization of the company and i didn't get sacked yeah, he obviously caveated that by saying, what I'm not saying is that I want you all to go out and try and wipe a billion dollars off the market cap of the company. But absolutely, he, uh, he, you know, it's about trying these things. We try them in social, we should try them in business as well. Adam, that is, uh, that is uh, so true. And I want, to sh I want to share with you something that I heard that was really thrilling to me. <laughs> I think it was week before, this last week, actually at the Gartner, um, Gartner Symposium Expo, uh, which is targeted to CIOs. And one of the things that was, I mean, I haven't, I've never been to them before, so I don't really know how they approach this thing, but they were really encouraging CIOs to start taking some risks. <laughs> They're like, you need to start doing things that might fail and mm. allocating budget for it. Um, and I, I thought, man, this is, okay, they're really, um, you know, because, you know, people who are in these positions, they need somebody like Gartner to say, you should be doing this. They need that, that you know, I, th they told me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so so i was really in, i was really encouraged by that um and i i you know i i know you know it's not going to happen overnight but i do think there will be more cios um that are taking more risks and looking at projects that they might otherwise not have looked at because gartner is telling them listen now is the time to take those risks you know when the when the economy they actually said this when the economy is, starts to get wobbly or there's, you know, that is actually when you're going to get your opportunity to do something that's going to put you ahead of the pack when you come out. And those are the kinds of things that we that I talk about and I know other people on this panel talk about all of the time. You've got to start taking some risks. Listen to work with listen to and work with some innovators <laughs> okay it's not all about going to the biggest shop that's going to tell you to do the same thing that everybody else is doing that will get you nowhere it will get you nowhere you've got to think and act differently to differentiate yourself in the market it's absolute I, must i can't think of a more risk averse member of the c-suite than the cio <laughs> they're all about preventing mistakes and and mitigating risk maybe, maybe the cfo 
Yeah, I was just about to raise your. I see your yeah, CFO. Yeah. Raise your CFO. <laughs> your CFO with the CFO. Yeah, maybe the CFO. But the interesting thing is, um, and I, will, I don't want to. I, I'll write about it, and maybe we can ha talk about it uh, another time. But um, they, they were talking about cybersecurity. Cybersecurity <laughs> was the cybersecurity was the like this is you need this for your brand because. People have to trust you if you're not taking care of cybersecurity, major issue. But then the but the thing they were talking about in terms of taking risks was talent. Mm, like okay. it, talent, and, and this is the last thing I'll say. They were saying how CEOs are now um, anticipating slower growth. In other words, they are pulling back their growth expectations because they can't find the talent and supply chain issues they can't find the, they can't get the raw materials to continue to drive growth which is but, pretty remarkable but you said about recruitment and both you and i have written about this recently lenwood you know this idea that uh the talk around this you know we need fresh talent we need a new way of thinking we need to modernize what it is that we're doing the problem uh the problem with that is that increasingly the people that are driving organizations are quite conservative in terms of the people that they hire. So, uh, you know, it's it's ironic that we've got a CMO that's failed. You know, they've not met any of their KPIs, so we're going to sack them. And the way we're going to hire a new uh, CMO is to take out of mothballs the old job description and we'll give it to the recruiters. And then lo and behold, we hire somebody that looks just like the person that walked out the door. And yeah. you know, the problem is that people need to say we need to we need to throw away our strategy for how we get talent into the organization. We need to look for people that have got a fresh perspective on this stuff rather than people that have got 20 years experience, because 20 years experience is really good if it's 20 years experience, 20 different years, not 20 years <laughs> any year of experience, which is what it often is. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that is a great point. I mean, the stuff that you learned five years ago, it's not applicable today. I mean, maybe the stuff that you learned two years ago. And that's it. It's a completely different uh, way of thinking um, that, you know, organization, you've got to start um, embracing this because the innovation cycle is moving. So the pace of innovation is actually accelerating. So, you know, to expect that a job will be the same, two years, two years is about the 18 months to two years, that job is going to be completely different. Yeah. If you're moving in a, in a, in a progressive way in your organization. So you've got to, you've really got to change your thinking about how you um, acquire, how you're acquiring talent. Just as a note, I actually reposted the Gartner, um, session Symposium. that I watched yesterday mm. on my page. So I'll actually drop a link to it in- uh, Is that the one where you said it's for HR? I'm sorry, what? Is that the one where you said this is essential for all HR folks to watch this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. The interesting thing is they were talking to CIOs, huh? but I said it was essential for HR because I wanted HR to know, hey, you might have a new ally in the CIO might have a new ally in the CIO, might want to start talking to them about what you'd like to do because in talent, Gartner's just told them talent strategy, you need to focus on it, CIO. This is what you should be doing. So, you know, the, the, the CIO probably has the deepest pockets in the organization. So, um, and HR may have the sh most shallow. So, um, you know, it's, um, you know, now's a great time to, you know, look for an ally in the CIO to get some things done. Cool. Brilliant. And if all else fails, someone's just posted a lovely dating app that we can all sign up to. So. <laughs> <laughs> it just fried my, fried my chat, but it's now disappeared. Yeah, yeah mine too. It, yeah. it got blocked. So that must be safe <laughs> to click on that link. <laughs> hey, take a risk. Why not? Hey, <laughs> boy. Great show. Yeah, great. Thanks for setting it up, uh, Adam. That was oh, good. Yes, my you. energy. Thank you. And thanks to everybody. So I just wanted to put my thanks in. Yeah, that was great. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Scott. So uh, thank all of you guys. 
thank everybody in the audience for great questions and interactions yeah. this week. And uh, see you all next week, I hope. Bye. Some nights, eh? Bye.